students, uh, welcome to another language session. This video is for the students of Standard 8, 9th and 10th, especially for students 9th and 10th because you have your assignments on this topic in literature. So if you've already done your assignments, please go through and see if you've identified your figures of speech correctly. And if you haven't, well, you can go through the video and see how it will help you further. All right, so we're going to do figures of speech today. In your examinations, they also ask you the question as to what are the literary devices that are used or what are the rhetorical devices. It all is a kind of amounts to the same thing. Rhetoric is basically sentences which uh, use elaborate language and doesn't need much, uh, needs to be explained further. Okay, so we have a look at what are figures of speech. So what are figures of speech and why do we use them in our uh, writing? Now remember figures of speech can be written in poetry as well as prose. You must have seen or you must have at least studied a few figures of speech. No harm done, you can always revise on some of them and we will build more on what you already know. So let's move ahead. What are figures of speech? They're basically words, expressions, phrases that you use okay, to enhance your writing. They serve the purpose of making your writing better. Okay, ornamental value as it's called. Uh, it adds more weightage to your writing and obviously it looks more flowery and beautiful. We want to always make our writing look pretty, right? Uh, like for example, when you paint, we try and enhance our artistic skills by different techniques. This is one of the techniques that we use when we're enhancing our writing skills. You can use uh, figures of speech in your short stories, in your narrative essay, argumentative essays, even uh, your picture composition, letter. You can use figures of speech in a lot of areas. Now, let's begin with the first one. Have a look at the sentence. Nana is as cool as a cucumber under pressure. And the second sentence, Manjot ran like a horse in the race. Now if you already know what we're kind of indicating, then you will notice that Nana is being compared to a cucumber, okay? While Manjot is being compared to a horse. Now these are very uh, dissimilar objects, very opposite of each other. They don't have things that are actually similar between them. I mean, one is a human being, the other is a cucumber or a horse. Um, however, I have still compared these two objects or uh, these two things. Okay, um, why do I do that? One, because Nena and the cucumber share one quality. The cucumber is a very cooling vegetable and uh, Nena is someone who stays cool under pressure. Uh, Manjot is being compared to a horse because of the ability of running. We all know that the horse is an animal it runs very fast. All right. So when I am comparing Manjot uh, to a horse, I am saying that they both share a similar quality of running very fast. Now, this is being compared using the word as Okay, as dash as, as well as like. So therefore, we arrive at what is the figure of speech and those who have already uh, figured it out, brilliant, you remember these figures of speech. If you haven't, then you need revision. All right, so this figure of speech is a simile. A lot of students make the error of writing it as smile in the exam, please be careful. Uh, this is a simile, it's basically comparing two objects that are not really similar but because they share a quality okay, with each other and we're comparing that, uh, these two objects, using the words as, like or so. So that's your first figure of speech. Now, let's look at the second uh, figure of speech. Tom was a lion in the fight. The camel is the ship of the desert. Alright, again, if you look at this figure of speech, these sentences, I am comparing Tom to a lion and I am comparing the camel to being a ship. Now why am I comparing these two objects? Again, they are very different from each other, but they share a quality that is similar. 
For example, Tom and the lion. When you see a lion in a fight, the lion is fierce. Okay, it's uh, very brave. And we're assuming that Tom was also fighting the same way, okay, with that same ferocity uh, in the fight, uh, as well as the camel, okay, now a ship. The ship, if you see, is used for traveling, for conveyance, right? We maneuver uh, and go to different air places on, in the ocean or seas using a ship, okay? Uh, well, while the camel is used to travel as a means of conveyance, as a mode of transport in the desert. So that is why, if you look at both the uh, sentences, they share a similarity because of one quality. Okay, here it is, the lion is fierce and so is storm fierce, while the camel and the ship are modes of transport in their areas. And so, but there is one thing that is different. We have not used the word as or like. Otherwise, it's very similar to the previous one. For example, I can say Tom was like a lion in the fight, right? That would make it a simile, but I have not used the word like. And so this becomes a metaphor, okay? A metaphor is when I compare two different things uh, which are not similar to each other because of a quality that they share and I don't use the word as or like. It is also called as an implied comparison, okay? That it is assumed that we are comparing these two objects. Uh, for example, there are n number of metaphors that are used in uh, your poetries and in your writing when it comes to your prose. Uh, one that comes to my mind is the eight standard poem, All the World's a Stage. The poem itself, the title of the poem itself is a metaphor. All the world is a stage, right? When I'm comparing the world to being a stage, right? Because they both share a similarity. And what similarity do they share? They share the role of the human being. The role of the human being on the stage, uh, on, in the world, sorry, playing different uh, parts, playing different, uh, char not character, but role in life from being a young child to being an adult as compared to the stage where an actor plays different roles uh, on the stage. So that is why the world is being compared to a stage because of the role of the human being. Okay, let's move ahead. You will, uh, for 9th and 10th standard, there are a lot of metaphors in your poems and the 9th standard, you have an assignment based on literary devices. So um, you need to understand how to identify these literary devices very, very carefully. Let's move ahead. Now, we all know our vowels. Okay? Vowels are alphabets that make the sound A, E, I, O, U. Each vowel has a sound. So A makes the sound A, E makes the sound E, I makes the sound E. Okay, so vowels have certain sounds. The other part of your alphabet is the consonant. Okay, they're not vowels and they include alphabets like B, D, H, G. Okay, so uh, and the others that follow which are not your vowels. Okay, now why do I need to know the difference between vowels and consonants? Because of the next figure of speech. So if you look at this sentence, she sells seashells on the seashore. Okay? Yeah, it's a tongue twister. I'll challenge you to say this as fast as you can. And it sounds hilarious. You can try it even at home with uh, your loved ones, mom and dad. Just get them to say these sentences fast. It is hilarious. All right? And look at the next one. This is long. Betty bought butter, but the butter was bitter. So Betty bought but better butter to make the bitter butter better. Okay, so uh, these are like your language tw uh, tongue twisters. However, they are also indicative of a figure of speech. What kind of figure of speech? If you look at the sentence, the S consonant is repeated um, several times in different words. And the letter S is uh, the first letter uh, of the different words that are used. Same way, Betty, uh, sorry, the letter B okay, is 
repeated several times over and over in different words at the beginning of each word. Therefore, and this adds like a rhythmic value, it adds like a poetic effect to your writing. Therefore, this is called as an alliteration. An alliteration is when you repeat a consonant sound. Remember the sound and not necessarily the alphabet. It can be repeated twice or more than two times. Okay, so it is the sound of the consonant and not just the alphabet that is repeated because the sound gives us that poetic effect. Okay, um, let's look at the next one which uh, the sentence goes as follows. The trees danced with glee in the winds. Uh, her patience to prevent that murmur soon replies. Now if you look at both these sentences, they share a literary device that you may already know. Uh, so if you've identified it, brilliant. If you haven't, well, this is for you. Uh, if you look at the trees, okay, I am saying that the trees can dance. While here, I'm saying her patience has the ability to reply. Now, both these things are very human quality. Okay, trees cannot dance. Human beings dance. All right. Uh, patience cannot reply. Patience is an abstract noun. Okay, it cannot give a reply. But here, I've given this quality to non-living things or abstract things or inanimate objects. The uh, qualities that are very human. Okay. So this is called as personification, where I personify certain objects. I give certain objects a human quality, which they would otherwise not have. Um, all right, so this is your personification. Let's proceed further. So here is another sentence. Now I love this one. Uh, just because we use it so often and we've used it as kids. You will hear a lot of kids using this. Uh, 10,000 I saw at a glance. She shed a bucket full of tears. Now, it's not possible to see 10,000 in one glance. All right, Many people don't see a lot of things in one glance. Uh, she shed a bucket full of tears. You cannot. <laughs> So it is not possible to shed a bucket full of tears. Another version of the sentence is, she shed an ocean of tears. It is not possible to shed an ocean of tears. So what am I doing here? Why am I using this? All right? This is called as an exaggeration. We always tend to exaggerate. In, uh, we love it because it kind of overemphasizes the things that we're doing. Okay? We want to show how difficult or how monumental that task was. That is why I tend to exaggerate, okay? And we do it regularly. For example, when you have been studying very hard for examinations, and the 9th and 10th will understand this, you will come and say, hey, you know what? I studied um, a million hours trying to get this right. You cannot study a million hours, all right? Or uh, little children, always use exaggeration when they say I kicked so hard that the ball went flying to America. Now it's not possible. But what is a child trying to tell you or what are you trying to say when you are exaggerating? You're trying to say that what the task that I did took a lot of effort or it was a big deal that I did that task and so I tend to exaggerate. This is called as a hyperbole. A lot of people mispronounce this again. You will hear a lot of people calling this hyperbole. Uh, it is not hyperbole, it is hyperbole. Okay? Hyperbole is an exaggeration. And we don't need to take this literally. Okay? We need to take it figuratively. That's why you mustn't, you mustn't ever say, I literally did this. It sounds wrong. Okay? Uh, let's move ahead. Uh, for example, you know, I, uh, something came to my mind. A lot of people uh, say this. I literally slept a hundred hours. You cannot literally sleep a hundred hours. You figuratively slept a hundred hours. So, yes. The next one. Grunt, grunt went the hawk. Or the hawk is a big kind of a creature. 
for those who don't know. The door shut with a thud. Now if you see in both the sentences, I have used a sound effect. We humans love uh, sound and you will see this in one of the figures of speech. We love uh, things that give us a sort of visual imagery or gives us an indication of what it may look like. Okay, And we connect with those things very fast. So when you say that, you may have heard people saying this, no? Uh, do this chop chop. Okay, Or uh, a lot of people, I don't have examples that are coming to my mind. Oh, you have kids who say, na, the car and vroom vroom. Okay, uh, what are they trying to do? They're adding sound effect okay, to whatever that they're saying because they want to make it sound better. They're adding ornamental value to what they're saying. Okay, so uh, this is called as onomatopoeia. Okay, onomatopoeia is basically a sound effect, words that tell you an indication of a sound. Uh, all right, let's move to the next one. Come may I, go I must. Now if you actually write the sentence, it should be as I come, I must go. Okay, but I have used a figure of speech there to add a sort of poetic effect, a lyrical effect to my sentence or to my written work. Uh, silver and gold have I none. Actually it should be I have no silver and gold. But I have no silver and gold sounds like a regular drab way of writing. I want to make it better, so what I do is I use an inversion. I invert certain words so that I can, a lot of poets use this, so because they use it to rhyme. Okay, so I invert words so that I can rhyme and I can give that sort of rhythmic quality to my poem. And those who write poetry, you must be already using this uh, in your, you know, in your writing. So yeah, this is inversion. Let's look at the next one. I love this one. So um, I posted a video on YouTube about how boring and useless YouTube is. And the name of Britain's biggest dog was Tiny. Now this is what is called as an irony. These are ironical statements. Why? Because the actual meaning, now if you look at the examples again, the actual meaning of the words is very different. Uh, the, sorry, the meaning of the word is uh, very different from what its actual meaning would have been. So, it's ironical, it's quite contrary. Why am I posting something on YouTube about how YouTube is useless? Or, uh, the, it's ironical, it's very different that uh, Britain's, the biggest dog, its name is Tiny. Now, there are many kind of ironies. There's situational irony, there's, sorry. There's dramatical irony and different types. You don't need to know all of these types. Uh, you can pick them out just by seeing how what is actually said conveys something that is very different from what the person actually means to say. For example, uh, this is for students of standard 9th and 10th will know. This is a poem called After Blenheim. And uh, in this, the old man keeps repeating the statement which is uh, the war was a great victory. Uh, now, why does he keep repeating this? Uh, he keeps repeating the statement, even though he is saying that the war cost a lot of lives, the war killed the poor soldier, uh, the war had uh, caused a lot of devastation, and yet he keeps calling it a great victory. He doesn't even know uh, why the war was fought, but he calls it a great victory, and that is ironical because he does not really understand. He knows that the war has been devastating. But what he's saying is very different from what he actually knows. Okay, so that is irony. Okay, um, let's look at the next one. If I'm going too fast for you, you can pause, have a look at the sentences again, and see if you're capable of identifying. Um, you can, after you finish, uh, sorry, after I finish and you finish watching the video. You can go through some of your poetic works and see if you can identify at least the basic ones. Like, can you identify a simile? Can you identify uh, a personification or a metaphor? Because they are easier to identify. Okay, let's look at this one. The dove is a symbol of peace. If I ask you what does a red rose mean, and that's why Valentine's Day and everything, right? The red rose is given. What does the red rose symbolize? It symbolizes love. Um, 
if you look at the color black, unfortunately, has always been uh, associated with something that is evil, something that is not good, impure. While white, unfortunately, has been. Why am I saying unfortunately? That is where discrimination comes. Now, white is very nice, black is very bad. So, um, uh, white is used as a symbol of purity. Um, a ladder may be used as a symbol in some poetic form as a connection between heaven and earth. A ladder is also used as a symbol of success. You climb up a ladder. Um, a broken mirror can be uh, to, in, uh, to symbolize broken relationships or a broken, or broken trust. Okay, so all of these are objects which are used to symbolize different uh, emotions or different things. Okay, and we use symbolism a lot in poetry and in written work. So 9th and 10th, if you want an example of symbolism, uh, this is what symbolism is, you can pause and read what it is, uh, but you need to understand how it is used. So for example, the old man at the bridge, lots of symbolism okay, that is used here. One of the symbolism could be uh, the goat, okay, one of the animals. If you look, what does it symbolize? The court is a symbol of all those victims of war. Okay, the innocents who die because they're not even part of the war, but they're, uh, they're killed in the destruction okay, of the war. Or if you look at uh, the bridge itself, the bridge is a connection of life, okay, where uh, the person has an opportunity to save himself. Okay, so the bridge is the link between life and death. On one side is the army where the fighting is happening, where the artillery, artillery is there, where the enemy is approaching, and on the other side you have life, a chance of survival. So the bridge is that connection between death and life, and uh, the old man is sitting at the bridge. It's his choice whether he's going to make that, uh, uh, you know, uh, trans, uh, what you call it, uh, sort of move across the bridge and save himself, okay, head towards a better life. Another uh, example of symbolism uh, could be, um, say, the cat. The cat is a symbol of all those people who are independent and are capable of surviving. Okay, if you see the cat as an animal has nine lives, okay, so these people, you could call them lucky, you could call them survivors, there are lots of things, okay, and so it is a symbol of um, of survival. Okay, these guys are survivors. They're making it through. Okay, they are going to eventually live through the war. Okay, and live to tell the tale of the war. Um, so this is old man and the bridge. Lots of symbolism in it. Uh, there are other chapters and poems also that you can go through, which have um, symbols that are used. Say even your bangle sellers has a lot of symbol. Each bangle is a symbol of a, of a stage in the life of a woman. Okay, uh, your um, yeah. So I'm gonna stop at that. I'm gonna tell you everything. Figure it out also a little. Now, uh, let's look at this is a poem by Edgar, Edgar Allan Poe. He's another poet, and uh, I'm not gonna read the whole thing. But if you look at this, the word bells of the bells keeps repeating. Now by that itself you should understand what the figure of speech is. This is repetition. Okay? Repetition is where words, phrases, sentences are repeated. Okay? And it is used in poetry and in prose. For example, again in After Plenum, uh, the word, the phrase, you know, it was a great victory, it was a great victory, is repeated. Why is it repeated? Because it is highlighting the irony of that statement. It is highlighting what the old man is trying to say, where they know how bad a war is bad, but they don't want to accept that. They, they keep saying that the war was uh, eventually a great victory, despite the devastation of the war. So that is why that phrase, um, this is also what is called as the refrain in the poem, because it is something that is repeated at the end of the poem, uh, constantly. Okay, so. Um, yeah, the great victory is a repetition. There are other such repetitions that are used. Uh, for example, um, from what I remember, um, eight standard you have in the bazaars of Hyderabad. You know, the, the 
poet keeps repeating what do you sell, what do you sell, what do you sell. So that is repetition, okay, because she's trying to emphasize on something on how beautiful the bazaars of Hyderabad are, how exquisite they are in the wares that are sold there. Okay. Uh, yeah, now I'm going to read the sentences out for you. It was dark and dim in the forest. The children were screaming and shouting. He whiffed the aroma of brewed coffee. The girl ran with her hands on a soft satin fabric. The fresh and juicy orange is very cold and sweet. Now just by the way I was reading it, Okay, I was emphasizing on certain words when I was reading this. Okay, because I wanted to uh, emphasize on what each word represents and each word builds an image in your head. This is called as imagery, where they appeal to our physical senses. Which physical senses? We have five physical senses. Your sight, your hearing, taste, touch and smell. Okay, and words that help us imagine what the person, the character feels or experiences through the physical senses in that particular situation is what is called as imagery. As a reader, I can connect with it. So when I drink an orange juice and I know it's cold and sweet and juicy, I know exactly what the author is talking about. Um, now, when you have imagery that is used which is indicative of sight, it is also called as visual imagery. When it's, uh, it shows us or it helps build an image of hearing, it is called as auditory imagery. Um, something that experience, uh, helps us experience what something would taste like, it is called as gustatory. Um, when it comes to touch, it is called tactile. And when it comes to the smell, it's called as olfactory. Do you need to remember all of the terms? Uh, if you can, great. If you can't, you can say that it is a visual, it is, a, it is an imagery that is indicative of sight. Okay, or it's a sight imagery. Or it helps uh, build an image of smell. So you can phrase your sentence that way if you can't remember all the terms. Uh, for, with reference to your assignments, it would be nice if you write the terms. It makes, in, it hand, it, enhances your writing. So, yeah. So again, for the five sentences that were used, if you look at the sentence, it was dark and dim. The very fact that it's dark and dim, the image that is created by dark and dim is a visual image. Okay, so it's visual imagery. The children were screaming and shouting in the fields. It is an auditory image because the sound of shouting and screaming, I can imagine what it is. Um, he whiffed the aroma of brewed coffee. Uh, this is an olfactory, okay? Because the minute you say brewed coffee, you know your um, your senses can connect to the smell of coffee when it's freshly brewed. Um, the girl ran hands on a soft satin fabric. We've all touched, you know, fabric that is soft and smooth and silky. So we. We have that tech, uh, tactile uh, experience and so we can connect to the statement because it builds that image in our head. And the fresh and juicy orange is very cold and sweet is gustatory because we all, in this hot summer, we all don't mind a nice cold glass of orange juice. And we know exactly what the author tries to communicate when they write those words. Alright, so this is your um, imagery. Okay? Uh, if you look at bangle sellers, there's a lot of imagery that is used again in this poem. Um, especially when they're building uh, with the symbols that are used uh, and uh, say the sound of the tinkling of the bangles, uh, the luminescent light that is falling, the bangles appear to be luminescent. So uh, all of this kind of builds imagery in us. When we think of there's nature imagery that is used in bangle cellars, the mist of the mountains or um, the cornfields, the yellow of the cornfields. It automatically builds visual and nature, natural imagery. Saroshki Naidu is very, very uh, used to, or she's very famous and popular for using imagery in her writing, which is also, if you see it in the next uh, poem for the eight standards that you have, 
in the bazaars of Hyderabad. There's a lot of imagery that is used here. Um, the sound of the, uh, the, the instruments that are used, or the, f the, sorry, the food stuff that is mentioned, the citrons, uh, pomegranate and plum, uh, or um, the saffron, the spices, okay, the colors of the wares that are sold, the amber, uh, jade. So this is all indicative of visual, and this one poem has lots of imagery. There's visual, there's olfactory, there's uh, gustatory, there's even uh, auditory. So all kinds of uh, imagery are, is used by Saloshini Naidu here in the poem in the bazaars of Hyderabad. Uh, for 9th and 10th standard, I told you about bangle sellers where a lot of visual imagery and uh, auditory imagery is used. Even uh, there's something called as nature, natural imagery. There are poets who are very, very popular at using nature and building an image of nature in their poem. Okay, so for example, daffodils has imagery of nature. So that's it for now for, with your figures of speech. Um, I will try and send or put up something um, with regard to you, with regard to helping you solve uh, a bit of your uh, figures of speech, maybe sentences that you can help identify and indicate uh, which figure of speech they are. But for the ninth and tenth, I think going through the video, you must begin with solving your assignments and picking out those literary devices that are there in your. Uh, chosen topic. Okay, for eight, uh, for the eighth standard, you don't have that right now, but um, it's always good to brush up on these figures of speech. All right. So thank you so much for watching the video. See you next time and stay safe.